I have had people tell me that they were planning to commit violent offenses, and they didn't commit the offense because somebody was nice to them. The Idaho killings, it's classified as a mass murder, but was the person who did it really a mass murderer, or were they a fledgling serial killer? We think of it that they're killing a lot of people, right? I think of it that they're killing the same person over and over again until the fantasy's perfect. Enthusiast, welcome to Break the Case. I'm your host. I'm Jen Coffendaffer. I have over 28 years of federal law enforcement investigative experience, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our second podcast regarding the true crime you care about. Now, we'll be cussing and discussing the true crime, and we're going to have some takes. Please don't be afraid to have a take and to let me know what you're thinking. We have such a special guest today. Uh, This guest is a clinical psychologist and his area of expertise, mass murderers, violent criminals, serial killers, and we are going to be breaking down the cases you care about the most with him today. We have become friends over the past several months. I just can't speak loudly enough as to the kind of character and kindness this guy always shows. So we are going to be talking about three really important cases. We're going to be talking about Ethan Crumbly. Now, you'll remember Ethan back in 2021. He decided to go into his Michigan school and commit carnage, uh, take out a gun and begin shooting fellow classmates. He murdered four people during his rampage. He's since pled guilty, but he's planning on an appeal. It's truly concerning why a 15-year-old would commit such a crime. We're going to be breaking that down with Dr. Mercado. Second, we're going to be looking at the accused murderer, Brian Koberger, of the Idaho Four murders. Ethan, Santa, Kaylee, and Maddie were all viciously murdered, it's believed, by a K-bar knife, one of the most sinister knives that can be used in terms of committing carnage against humans. Why? because the length of the blade, because it has that bar that permits the killer to keep stabbing and stabbing without having injury to himself, because this occurred at a college campus. Really just walk across the street and you were on campus. This small house at 1122 King Road where six of these students were and four of them viciously murdered. We're going to be breaking down what kind of a person it would take to commit this kind of murder. Finally, we're going to take a look at Rex Hureman. Rex Hureman is charged with the Gilgo Four murders and believed to possibly have committed other murders. The Gilgo Four, Maureen, Melissa, Amber, and Megan. These were all sex workers, and I hate to call them that because they were so much more. They were mothers. They had other employment, they were daughters, they were sisters, they were friends. But it was through their work that Rex Heuerman, it is believed, found them and lured them into his lair. Now, what was particularly interesting about this case was the manner in which they were bound. He used burlap, belts, and other restraints to very uniquely bind them. We're gonna talk about that. And a little bit of housekeeping. There aren't very many things that are free left in this country, but subscribing to this channel is quite free. So I hope you'll take a quick second to just press the subscribe button. Would love to have you as a subscriber here. And now without further ado, it is time to don the headsets and interview Dr. Gary Bricado. Dr. Bricado, I am so happy to be here with you. Uh, I know we've been working on getting this together. And uh, I just can't uh, really express enough how much I appreciate you coming on board and educating today on uh, what I'd like to start with is mass murders. You really literally wrote at least one of the books on this subject. And our audience really cares about getting in the mind, if you will, of these mass murderers. So take it away, doctor. What do you have? First of all, before we can have any reasonable discussion of this, we have to define what mass murder even means. Uh, And there is a there is not 
full consistency across people who study this or even in legal circles of what the term means. Um, if you were to look at the FBI definition or the crime classification manual, for example, um, which is written by the Burgesses, John Douglas and, and uh, Ressler, uh, you'll see that the definition is that there are four people who are killed in the same place at the same time with no cooling off period. There are other people, myself included, who use the, de the definition of three people uh, that are killed in the same place at the same time. But the key is that there isn't that pause that you might see in a spree killing where, for example, you, you kill several people in one location and then go elsewhere and kill, like we saw in the Adam Lanza case, just technically mm -hmm. not a mass shooting was a spree killing. Another example of a spree killing that gets inaccurately called a mass murder would be the Elliot Roger case, because there was the, the stabbing of the roommates before the attack um, on the women, uh, so that, that you want to understand the multiple location thing. And it's also distinguished from serial killing, because in serial killing, there is a break, a cooling off period that some people say is at least a month between your offenses, right? And you need, according to the current definition, two or more murders separated in time. So once we have that definition, then the idea is, how do you go about doing a large-scale study of it? I, alongside Dr. Raggy Gurgis at Columbia Medical Center, um, was the creator of the largest study that was ever done of mass murder. We looked at essentially every mass murder um, reported in an English-language uh, um uh, media outlet uh, for 119 years uh, and were able to come up with some pretty clear and interesting trends. Uh, we didn't just look at mass shootings. We looked at all types. And um, if you'd like, I could talk a little bit about the general trends we found or, or you know, just to, so it doesn't turn into a, a dialogue, a monologue. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. I'd love to hear about the trends. And I think what people really love to understand is really getting in the mind of somebody capable of such atrocities, right? Because all of us can't really imagine it. And we watch these stories and we follow true crime because we're fascinated with something we can't relate to. So help us relate, Doc. One of the most important things that we discovered in this work is that there was a an overly heavy emphasis in people who try to understand mass murder, mass shootings or mass murder generally, on mental illness, on severe mental illness, by which most people are referring to psychosis, where a person loses touch with reality, hears voices, you know, sees things, believes things that aren't true, might be disordered in the mind. The truth is, is that is you know, a, really a, a fragment of people who commit mass murder, who have serious mental illness of that type. It is more likely, statistically, we found, in people who use weapons other than guns. If a person were to use a knife, for example, to commit a mass murder, you would be more inclined to think that the person might have had some, some authentic, serious psychiatric difficulty at some point in the person's life. There are other reasons why a person might choose a knife. If they are more of the serial killer variety, might have been chosen more for the cruelty or the symbolism or the fantasy. But when someone impulsively picks up a weapon to commit a mass murder or plots it and uses something other than a gun, you start wondering more about serious mental illness. What we did find to be much more predictive of a mass murder is drugs or alcohol used uh, in the past or currently and any kind of legal history. Those are much more important red flags. And the third, and this gets right to your question about the type of person who does this, had to do with breaking down the motive as we could ascertain it from available information. So if someone lives and they go to court, and there are court documents, we could get information about the motive. Sometimes it was described in a manifesto or a notebook or an online post or something. Sometimes you can glean it from comments that were made at the time of the offense or whatever. And what we learned was, was this. Mass murder is generally committed by people who lack coping skills and emotional resources to deal with what I call a proximal event, an event that occurs just prior to the incident that leaves the person feeling that his or her identity has been completely washed away and there is no reason for the individual to exist. So why should you, right? 
And so what happens to people like this almost invariably is we discover, uh, in fact, whenever I hear about a mass murder, it's my first question, that the person lost something. They either had a job, they were in school, they had a significant other, they had a, you know, whatever. And it was taken from them. They had a political belief and the person they were, they supported was not elected again or whatever. They, the person can become very brittle and they feel that their entire identity has been destroyed. So now through the either suicidal action of committing this offense as in with the intention of killing the self or as an expression of rage, we see the individual go out and try to make meaning out of their life through the act. And so you can see if you name any mass murder, uh, you can see that there's a proximal event that occurs before. So simple example, the Koberger case is a mass murder. So what would the proximal event be right before? Well, what it looks like if he's guilty his approximate event was getting in trouble at school because of reports by women that he was being inappropriate as a TA. That was something that would have lent a person like Koberger a sense of power, control, personality, identity, purpose, and it's now been taken away, right? Or another example might be uh, in the case of Adam Lanza. What happened to Adam Lanza? It is a spree shooting, but what happened to Adam Lanza approximately? Well, there was talk that he was going to be put into an institution. So he was angry at mom, who he kills before he goes off to the school. So that you always want to ask, what was that triggering event, so to speak, right? What is that What is that event that pushes the person into feeling there's no other purpose? And then that gets into a whole other topic, which we could really talk about, I think, at length, which is that the time we are living in, when identity is so murky, when people who have difficulty tolerating the grayness of identity in 2024, you have a problem where individuals are, are groping for something to sort of pin themselves to that will give them a sense of purpose and identity. And so what a lot of people will do is be very drawn to very black and white, hateful thinking because it gives them a purpose and a clear enemy, right? Or they might become um, fanatically involved in a, in a particular philosophical belief or racism, or something like that, because it gives scope and purpose to the identity. And if that person feels that that is threatened, they will go out and, and commit these kinds of offenses. So that, that's the long answer, is the triggers to look for are drug and alcohol use, previous legal history, difficulty coping with a proximal event. And if I were in a school setting or work setting, and there were an employee who had that mixture, I would be paying attention. What makes... Some mass murderers or spree murderers make the decision that either A, they're going to commit suicide afterwards, or they're going to have the police kill them afterwards, or they're going to go on the run, or they're going to just try and, and hide the fact that they ever committed the crime. To me, those are such different reactions afterwards. Can you break that down for us a little? Well, first of all, we have to make a distinction between a mass murder that is impulsive and a mass murder that is plotted. You have a very different personality structure if in the cool light of reason you say, I really want to get revenge on these people because of, you know, my sour grapes that they are still in school and I'm not. So in a few weeks, I'm going to go out and commit this. That takes much more of a fantasy oriented, cruel personality. Very similar to what I've already described, but you have the extra element of being a little aberrant. With the more impulsive type, it's much more emotional, angry, not very thought out. And the person goes out abruptly after getting news or making a discovery that someone's been unfaithful or something like that. And those people are much more likely to say, I don't even want to be alive. I, I just want to die, you know. But with that more aberrant type, it's not really about hopelessness. It's about leveling the playing field against the people that have hurt you. So the motive is different. It's more the hopeless type that wants to die. Now, I'll tell you, I talked to a person, you know, and I'm going to slightly change the details here to protect the person I'm talking about. But I talked to a person once who had jumped in front of a train, a subway train. And I'm very interested in understanding the psychology of why people choose the particular method of suicide that they do. And so I said to the individual, why a train? Teach me. Make me understand what that was about. And the person said, well, I was sitting on the subway platform feeling very alone. And I was looking at all these people getting on the train with their school bags on their way to school or holding a satchel on the way to work or hugging their loved one or walking with their child. And I thought, I don't have any of that. So not only do I want to die, 
But if I jump in front of the train, the train can't get them there either. They won't get to school. They won't get to their loved ones. They won't get to work. So that what you immediately start to sense there is that there's a second motive. If one is to is to eliminate oneself because you're hopeless and feel ostracized, but the second is a kind of revenge, a sour grapes, and forcing the individuals to get out of the train and look at you and to know that you existed. It's like a way of saying, I was here, like you carve it in the tree of life on your way out. So that there's something strangely validating to the individual in feeling that on their way out, you know, there's now going to be a Wikipedia page about them, you know, because they... Uh, they decided to commit this atrocious act. And that's why I think you can't ignore the elephant in the room, which is that it is very tied to the contemporary philosophical issue of identity, because the people need a sense of purpose. And if you're living in a time when we've made the sense of purpose murky, you wind up with people who have nowhere to go and they're scared. And so they'll latch on to one thing. And if they lose that one thing, there's nothing left for them. That, that's the whole idea. So as the, philo the philosophy of a time changes, don't be surprised that mass murder increases. There's a tie between these things. And, um, and I find that particular thing kind of fascinating. It is fascinating. Just what you brought up there, sort of a sense of punishment, right? Yeah. I mean, he wanted to punish other people for having a good life for, you know, you know where I've seen this, Dr. Bacotta, not to hopefully digress because I want to stay on this track, but you even see it on social media, of right? Course. Where people just attack. It's not in a physical sense, but it's in a verbal and in an emotional and abusive sense. Yeah. Do you see those sorts of parallels on social media? Well, what I find very interesting about social media is that you have a quality that is actually common in a certain type of serial killer, which is the individual has created a persona that is stronger than the self, that exists only in the shadows, you don't know who it is. And now the person feels empowered to mock, ridicule, make other people feel small. I am convinced that if you could look behind a lot of those online handles at the people who are making remarks like that, that they would be mighty pathetic people. These are the kind of people that, you know, would do something like, you know, lurk in the shadows and create a moniker for themselves, like a lot of offenders do, like Zodiac or Son of Sam or Jack the Ripper or where you create a, a larger than yourself persona to scare people. But you're sort of pathetic. Right. And um, you, that's incidentally something if we were to talk about Coburg or anything comes up there, too. Right. Hiding in the shadows, using false names on the Internet, potentially you know, being scarier than you would be if anybody actually pulled the curtain away and saw you. Um, I am convinced that that's one of the reasons that, that those offenses were committed at night in the dark. Darkness is like a costume for a pathetic person. When people are sleeping, you know, they're not going to look at you and say, why should I be afraid of you? You're pathetic. In the costume of darkness, you can be great, powerful, attractive, whatever you want. I think that's a very important point for people to understand that there are certain types of people who feel stronger when they wear the costume of an online aid identity. When they're in the cloak. I like that. And they're hiding behind the cloak. So let me ask you this, Dr. Bricotta. We've talked about, you know, mass murderers. But what I want to focus in on now is mass murderers or spree killers that are young, mm -hmm. that are really children. I know uh, I was looking up some statistics before our conversation, and I know there's not a lot of them. But right now, we see, of course, Ethan Crumley in the news. He's going to, uh, right. he's already pled guilty. But uh, somebody who is young like that, we saw it with uh, Klebold, uh, Harris, uh, back in the Columbine days. What would motivate really a child, somebody is, who really hasn't even began their life, to have that much hate? And would we call it hate? Or, or what would we describe it as? Well, first of all, like a classic mass murder, like I talked about earlier, you should always ask, what did he lose before the shooting? And the answer is two things. One was that his best friend had moved away. It was really the only friend that he had. And the second was that he lost a very beloved pet. And pets are very interesting because pets love you in a perfectly <laughs> stable way. And when you lose one, it's like you lost what is probably a replacement for for a stable parental object or some other person that just loves you 
irrespective of what you look like or what you feel like. And what I think is that this is a person who had two things in his life that felt stable and that felt like they loved him the way he was. And then they were gone. And then in addition to that, we know that there was some political stuff going on, which I won't get very much into, but we know that in his journal, he talked about hoping that the event would draw attention to some political policies and might hasten the impeachment of then of President Biden, who had been uh, pretty newly elected at that time. What you wind up with, again, is somebody who's in a some kind of soup of identity and lacking stable attachments. And then the things that give him scope and purpose and a sense of family and belonging are tugged from him. And so you might say, well, didn't he have any other stable forces in his life? Well, we know that parents who are themselves in hot water for this situation were people who had their own legal troubles, where there was previous you know, contact with child protective services where, you know, there was giving your child a firearm, you know, or access to a firearm. Picture a chaotic environment in which a person is groping for some kind of identity. So what I think is you, you, you have a person at an age when they're a little more impulsive, their identity is murkier, they can be a lot more emotional and lack coping skills. They may not have been in, in a good psychotherapy or taking any kind of, you know, someone to teach them coping skills. It raises this question of, Well, how important is it then to be kind to people and love people when you're in a a kind of academic environment? Because we don't realize how that could actually save lives. I have had patients, no joke, I have had people tell me that they were planning to commit violent offenses. And they didn't commit the offense because somebody was nice to them. And I mean, you know, nasty stuff. And, uh, And someone just came up to them and said, you okay? How you doing? Have a good day. And this can make or break whether the person goes out and commits a violent act. It is very important because you're talking about a person who feels completely alone and invisible. And one kind person can be enough. There are even mass shooting cases I've reviewed where the person will go around shooting people and intentionally skip over a person who had been nice to them when they were in school. It sounds trite. But we don't realize how important it is to be the one who goes to a person being bullied and says, I kind of like you the way you are, that you're all right. You know, let me take you under my wing a little bit. Um, Classic example of that, the mass shooter, uh, Nathaniel Smith, Mm -hmm. um, who went on a spree shooting out the window at people of different racial groups that that he had an issue with. For a long time, uh, you know, he had been glued together. By the fact that he had a teacher who was inviting him over and watching movies with him and, and being kind to him. When that fell apart, he then became attracted to a, to a very, very strange religious leader who had a lot of peculiar ideas, very you know, aggressive ideas. You know, and when that guy lost his or was threatened with the dissolution of his legal license, this guy felt like he lost the only figure that ever gave him a sense of purpose. So he went on a spree. That's the key to this stuff is, is that these people are alone. Yeah, I think it's really important you bring that up, Doc, because yeah. so many people that are listening in, they have kids, they are going to communicate maybe this very session. And I think it's just such a big reminder for all of us to reinforce with our children. Hey, listen, don't pick on anybody. Not only don't pick right. on somebody, but how about lift them up? And, and, you know, those reminders, just be kind. Uh, I think it's such just a great reminder of not trying to pass off giving these people an excuse, but trying to say, wow, throw that helping hand when you can. The other thing that's very important to understand is, yes, it's true that there's an exaggeration of the number of mass murders, particularly mass shooters who are mentally ill in the severe sense. That there's also an exaggeration of the number of them that are psychopathic or that people would think of as, quote unquote, evil in their actions. But most mass murderers are people who are having a very hard time in the world coping with life events. They're ill in that sense, in that there's a brittleness to them. They lack a sense of belonging. There's very little to hang their hat on in terms of why they're in the world. And there's, there can be a bitterness or a paranoia there. Not a psychotic paranoia, but just a general mistrust of other people. And a lot of them have been, you know, disproportionately have been victims of things like bullying and and ostracization and stuff like that. So the the key is don't give people a proximal event. Don't give them the match that is set to the straw. 
right? Be kind to them, and it can it can put this stuff off until perhaps the person is old enough that they have a little more of a breaking system. All right, and and what about Doc? Just too recognizing that as loved ones, as as friends, that right. uh, you know how fragile. Uh, that person might be. I think it's so much about education, and certainly yeah. this has been educational. I had never heard anything regarding why people jump off of train tracks, and I just love that that the anger that was seething inside of them. But there was an event That's that right. led to that anger. We want to think of these things as aberrations that occur in people that are quote unquote crazy, or that right. are evil, or where there's a supernatural kind of. But it's very attractive to get seduced by that, but it doesn't match the reality when you go in criminologically and examine it or psychologically and examine it. What's uncomfortable about it is it forces us to grapple with the fact that those of us in the general population are capable of really awful things. We don't want to see that. So we like Mm -hmm. to think there are bad people and there's me. But the fact is that, you know, if you were to lay out motives for homicide on a spectrum, as I did with Michael Stone in in my book, The New Evil, you could see that there are people who have a fantasy oriented, cruel, you know, personality structure where they're going to repetitively kill until they perfect a fantasy. But lower on the scale are people who who are really operating under emotional stress and situational factors who are not the type of people who will go out and do it again. It's a thing that that happens under duress. So, like, for example, let's compare two murders that are both motivated by the same thing. So, like, jealousy. Very human. We can understand it. In France, they, they understand the concept that you might not even be guilty if you're operating purely under jealousy, right? They call it the the clean passionnel, the crime of passion, right? Two cases, one purely emotional, one much more methodical and cruel, same motivation. So the first one, there was a man called Samuel Collins in Maine. It wasn't a very famous case, but he was really very crazy about his wife. He adored her. She was his whole life. And he decided mm-hmm. to surprise her at work with some flowers. And when he went into her, the supermarket where she worked, he found her uh, in intertwined with a male co-worker he went home and waited for her with a blade and when she came home he basically cut his own wrists after stabbing her to death he survived that but it was a pure jealousy inspired thing totally impulsive no plotting it just happened now in the second case was a woman called els clotemann she was a, a, a belgian woman who was in a love triangle with a woman and an instructor in a skydiving group. They made an arrangement that these two women were going to take turns with this man. One day he would sleep with one, the next day he'd sleep with the other, etc. So one day it works out that Els Clodemann is at the house on the day when it's the turn of the other woman to be with this man. And they're now having their tryst or whatever in the other room, and she's listening to it and seething with jealousy. So instead of impulsively doing something, like in the Collins case, she severs the release cord on the parachute that is going to be used, I think, Mm -hmm. nine days later in a jump they're going to do together. So now, here they are on the plane, nine days later, and they're all getting ready to jump, and the instructor goes, and the other woman goes, and the third woman, Els Kodamon, pretends she's going to jump, but instead she leans out and watches this woman fumble to her death many miles to the ground extremely cruel methodically plotted cold right same motivation one was totally impulsive one was methodically plotted so the way i think is that's the that's the way you want to think about a case to predict if it's the type of person who would ever do it again in the collins case it was emotional he could be talked to he could understand what he did feel regret which he did clodemont's case i'm not so sure that's a nasty mm-hmm. person who, who is the kind of person who is clearly leveling the playing mm-hmm. field, no matter what it takes. Cold, reptilian. And you want to make the same distinction when you think about mass murder. Is it calculated? Like you mentioned, Klebold and, and Harris at, at Columbine. That was methodically plotted. Remember that one mm-hmm. of the boys was a psychopath. <laughs> the other one was a weaker-willed guy that went along with him. But one was psychopathic in nature, clearly. Much more cruel. 
It's very difficult to compare that to a more impulsive mass murder where you take a weapon and run to school, right? So I think that's how you want to think about it. More like a crumbly. That's tricky because with, with crumbly, there was, there was plotting. Remember, he had written, you know, there were even been warnings. Crumbly was an odd boy, okay? Uh, there was an incident, for example, where he brought the severed head of a bird into school in a jar, mm -hmm. right? He was a weird boy, you know, the kind of person who does odd things and then doesn't understand why people don't want to be his friend, right? And um, there was also an incident at that school. I remember reading about it. I, I don't think it was ever tied to him officially, but it's pretty suspicious that the kids are sort of playing out in the yard and then the severed head of a deer came rolling off the roof of the school and just lands with a thud in the middle of the schoolyard. Now, you know, that's the kind of thing that if he were responsible for it would be very suggestive of a person that is seething with aggression, is trying to be provocative, is trying to make a screech, you know, that they want attention, that they're, yeah, et cetera, right? Tells you something about that there is a plotting element there and a, and a, and a rage in that person. But I think of him more as a plotter. Impulsive mm -hmm. would be more the, the, you know, the kid that gets hurt and then pulls something out of their bag and then just starts attacking other people. Yeah. Back to Crumbly really quick. I read something interesting in his journal where he said that he wanted to be famous. And I thought that was also interesting. It seems like in all of these situations where the person doesn't take their life or doesn't do a suicide by cop and stays alive, that that is a key component. Well, ego. Ego is the whole point is, is that your ego has been slighted and you want to level the playing field. So if you have been all the way down here, the only way to level the playing field is to be all the way up here. Being noticed is not enough. You've got to be famous to compensate for how low you felt. So that the, the idea is that that speaks to precisely what I'm talking about, the difference between the impulsive, sad person or more ill person and the person who has more of an ego drive to commit the, the murder. It's all about being noticed, getting an identity through forcing people to know you're there. Like the person who says, if I jump in front of that train, <laughs> those people won't get anywhere either. And, um, and there are, you know, there are mass murders I could talk about that are, that are just so hideous in the plotting and scheming. And I mean, there are even mass murders that are designed to leave a person feeling guilty that they are responsible. Simple example of that. Do you remember Laura Black, the woman who was relentlessly stalked by Richard Farley? Her, she was the, the basis of the movie with Brooke Shields. What happened in Laura Black case? Quick version. Laura Black was working at a company as, at, at, where this sort of oddball guy went out to lunch with her one day as a kindness. She took him out to lunch with another co-worker. He mistook that as an indication that they were in love. Started writing her hundreds of letters. I mean hundreds of letters. And made her life a living hell. She kept changing where she lived every time she would move. She would go out to the car, and on the windshield would be a Xerox copy of her new key, which he had managed to get a copy of. It terrified her. And then what happened is, when he finally showed up at her job with a firearm and started killing all of her co-workers, she's injured but not killed. And I always thought it was very obvious that part of the motive was to make her feel that she was responsible for all those other deaths. Because she she had gotten a restraining order against him and was going to separate from him through the restraining order. And his threat was, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to make your life a living hell in privacy. So you're going to have guilt the rest of your life and be injured mm -hmm. the rest of your life because you rejected me. I mean, that is a spiteful motive for a mass murder. So that, again, you can't lump all these people under the same umbrella. We see the same distinction in serial killers. The more psychotic offender like Richard Chase, who thought that he had to kill people to suck their blood to prevent his blood from pulverizing because UFOs were transmitting rays into his blood to steal his energy, is very different than the serial killer who says, you know, my mother abused me when I was a child and I hate women and I now go around trolling for women who kind of resemble her that I'm going to torture and sexually assault repeatedly to level the playing field against her. That is a very different type of person. But if you ask people in the general public, they just think serial killers are all the same. So I think what I'm all about is gradations that, are, that have to do with motive. I think it's a much more sophisticated way to think. And then the thing that also adds to the sophisticated way to think about it, I think, 
is to also think of the person as existing in a cultural and kind of chronological frame where you also want to think about what is going on in the world around that person and in the time period in which they live that gives shape and scope to the way the person commits the offense. It is not a coincidence that, for example, sexual homicide of the type that I just talked about, it occurred, but it was virtually non-existent in the press before the 1960s. After the 1960s, there was such an explosion of serial killing with targeting women for sexual reasons that the FBI had to create you know, a group to look at it to figure out why it was happening. And you wind up in the 70s with the Behavioral Science Unit to answer that question. Well, obviously, that was cultural and represented some kind of backlash against the freedoms that women were developing and brittle, you know, awful men who had an issue with it. That is not in any way intended to sound like a blaming statement. I think it's wonderful that women have those freedoms. But the trouble is that you wind up with certain brittle people who can't handle it. They hate it. They're furious about it. You, you always want to think in the cultural way about things. And then you want to say, well, what about? The technology. If you don't have the technology, you can't commit crimes of a certain awfulness. So that's the other piece. Prior to the 1970s, you didn't have wide scale availability of weapons of, of mass murder, you know, semi automatic weapons of uh, firearms, mm-hmm. military style weapons that were out in the general public. So you didn't have those, <laughs> those, those things that couldn't happen because the technology wasn't available. So you always want to think technology, culture, motive. You know, and psychological pro- uh, strength and functioning of the person, and what's the proximal event? Once you put all that together, and then of course fantasy, I think you got your six points that you want to kind of look at in any case to really understand what's going on there. I do want to transfer over to serial killers, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I really want to start with the Idaho killings because mm. it's classified as a mass murder, right? But Was the person who did it really a mass murderer or were they a fledgling serial killer? When you talk about the fact that I think many of us believe that there was one target, maybe two, but one target, that's my belief, and that the others were at the wrong place at the wrong time. And really, the entire fantasy just ended up going into shambles. And maybe this was really a first attack. Can you talk to us about your thoughts on the Idaho case? Well, I have a lot to say about this. First of all, um, about everything, really. We found in the database that about 11.78% of mass murderers were actually serial killers. Before or after the mass murder, there was a cooling off period with a, with a different murder. For example, Gary Ridgway, who by coincidence was caught on the same day, November 30th, same date that the Crumbly shooting happened. Just odd factoid in Dr. Ricardo's head. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I can tell you that with Ridgway, Ridgway started out as a spree killer and then became a, a serial killer because the duration between the offenses. There are some people like that. Now, how do we tell the difference? Well, it has a lot to do with what the motive is, and we can only divine, you know, guess uh, what the what the motive was in the Idaho case. Now, obviously, Kohlberger, the suspect, is innocent until proven guilty, but whoever committed that, and, you know, and I had done a kind of a profile of that case before there was even a suspect, which people can find on the web. The motivation in the Idaho case seems to be one that is more like what we would see in a serial killer. It seems to be associated with somebody somebody leveling a playing field, somebody with at least subtle sexual motivation there because of the focus on the female victim, the probability that there was some sort of surveillance of that house for a period of time in some manner. Um, which can have a very fetishistic quality to it if a person is snooping or engaging in voyeurism. Uh, And uh, there's also, you know, the keeping of trophies, which is something like, for example, we know that there was a box with ID cards that belong to two people. We don't know who they are. That has a very trophy-like quality to it. For example, in the original serial killer study done by the FBI, the number one object that was kept as a trophy by serial killers was ID cards, particularly driver's licenses, because it has something to do with the idea of taking the person's identity, literally, mm-hmm. and owning it, right? You are now mine, you know, so I have your identity. See, there is that quality, a stalking component, which appears to have probably been present. 
and the enactment of some kind of fantasy. And my guess, based on the evidence, is that there was a person who was being obsessively targeted, at least one female victim. And that what probably happened is there was some, I can't prove it, but my gut tells me there was some electronic means of surveillance of what was, of what was going on in that home that had to be turned off on the night of the attack. And in turning it off, it prevented learning the information that certain people were up and about and in the house that were not expected to be there. So that upon arrival to finally enact this fantasy, there's the shock of discovering other people there so that it becomes a mass murder only because several of the victims were eliminated simply to get them out of the way or because they were witnesses. And what I think is then you then it begs the question, well, what about the other people who were left alive? Well, remember that if Koberger is guilty, by his own description, he had a dissociative quality to him. And what you would have is a person who, in the frenzy of what was going on, probably dissociated, blipped out, zoned out, got overwhelmed, leaves the sheath and strolls out in a daze because he had talked about being somebody who experienced those kinds of symptoms uh, when he posted online about his mental health. And I also think that, you know, the deed was done and it's very exhausting. I think the general public doesn't understand the adrenal exhaustion that would be associated with killing four people. Mm -hmm. I strongly suspect that that was a mass murder only for the pragmatic, I hate to say it, pragmatic reason of needing to eliminate some people who were preventing the original purpose of the attack. That implies to me that this is a person that, let's say he really did this, but by some technicality goes free. I think the jury needs to understand that he has the personality structure, if he's guilty, more of a serial killer, so that they understand what's on the line with a release. <laughs> Right. I presented once on a news program, I talked about this case and the, a lawyer who was on sort of interrupted me and said, the motive doesn't matter. And if I had been given a chance, I would have said it does matter because if somebody has the personality structure and motivations of a serial killer, they're not satisfied with one offense, it's particularly one that they botched. They would have to do it again to perfect it. And that's what we see in serial killers is it's like a going out and repetitive because we think of it that they're killing a lot of people. Right. I think of it that they're killing the same person over and over again until the fantasy is perfect. I didn't do it very well the first time I screwed up. And then, of course, you and I, you know, could speculate about this. But there are very few serial killers where the motive isn't at least partially sexual and Burgess and Burgess of the FBI study my work with all the time at, at Boston College. She talks about how, how sometimes the sexual motive is there, but it's channeled into something else or it's subtle. You don't realize that it's sexual, but it gives sexual gratification to the person. They're, most serial killers are sexually motivated. There's a very small number of them that are more interested in the ego component, you know, just being better than you. Well, there's no sexual component. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because one case that just strikes me is like a, that. Actually, I'll, I'll mention a couple, and both were never solved. One is the Zodiac Killer. Oh, my favorite. That it yeah, right. doesn't seem to be necessarily a sexual component. There are some serial killers where there is no overt sexual motivation. The motivation seems to be that there is a mission, a misanthropic anger toward a certain group. And you're getting revenge against them. So, for example, the Unabomber, Ted Kuczynski, was a person who had a mission. There was no sexual component at all. In fact, I think he was a rather asexual individual who was using bombs to kill people because of anger about ideas he had about the environment. He is a serial killer because of the cooling off period between offenses. But there's no sexual motivation. You also see the lack of sexual motivation in people that are serial killers who are killing people just to get rid of witnesses like a robber that is shooting the owner mm -hmm. of the store, uh, and then a month later does it again. But this is gets to a very interesting point, which is that I do not like the current definition of serial killing. The original definition of serial killing was that there were three victims separated in time by a cooling off period, and that the killing was done in the, in the service of abnormal psychological gratification. The current definition says two victims separated in time by a cooling off period. Done. Which means that the guy who's bumping off the owners of the stores he's robbing is a serial killer. If there's a break between the killings of a certain number of weeks, 
that's a problem because a true serial mm-hmm. killer is a person motivated by fantasy. That's why they keep repeating it. You wouldn't necessarily keep repeating if you were just doing it to get rid of witnesses. If there were no witnesses, you'd stop. In fact, the general public doesn't understand that, in my experience, that the word serial killer, the term serial killer, originally had nothing to do with the point that there was a series. It came from the word serial, meaning one of those little movies that they would show before the full feature in the 30s and 40s when you went to the movies like a chapter play or a cliffhanger where you would see like the Lone Ranger or Charlie Chan or, you know, Green Hornet or something. And the idea was that the serial killer was like the evil character in one of those serials because they were so hell-bent on doing evil things that they became like a caricature of a human being that only wanted to do terrible things. That's an interesting segue into Zodiac, who some people believe was inspired Mm -hmm by the villain Zodiac in uh, a Charlie Chan movie, right? Um, which is very interesting. Certainly when he wore his costume at Lake Berryessa, he looked like a ridiculous villain from an old movie. So when you think about Zodiac, can you say that there was no sexual motivation? Well, first of all, it's very clear that the men were rather quickly dispatched, or at least he attempted to quickly dispatch them, with the focus being more on the women who always died. The, the, the women were clearly the recipients of more rage. And also, there was some time spent with some, of, well, for example, in the very first canonical case, some people think it was Cherry Joe Bates in Riverside, but the, the canonical where nobody disagrees, right? The first canonical victims are when you had the Jensen and Faraday shootings where they went on a date to a lover's lane, and he goes and he abruptly kills the boy. And then in the pitch dark is running after Betty Lou Jensen and he's put a pen light on the back of the, the scope so that that light will fall exactly where the bullet is going to hit. And he basically is enjoying, I'm sure, that she's running and screaming in the pitch dark and he shoots her multiple times in the back in a close circle of bullets and she dies. And I think that that suggests that there was a, a somewhat of a misogynistic component to it because of how much he he focused on the female. At Lake Berryessa, the male lives because he's stabbed, you know, in a different way than Cecilia Shepard. Uh, Brian Hartnell lives. But Cecilia Shepard is stabbed in areas that are much more sexual zones, near the breast, near the vaginal area. And she is brutalized, you know. You know so that I think there, no matter how much he may have tried, it, there was a subtle sexual component, but it was not very overt. But I think it's possible that he wasn't interested in expressing rage through sexual assault, but in simply killing or sadistically kind of tormenting psychologically a female. The key to Zodiac is that Zodiac figured out that it wasn't necessary to kill anymore if he could just pretend that he was secretly committing random offenses that you didn't realize were his. So all you have to do is write a letter to the newspaper or the police and say, there are going to be these killings, and you're going to think that they're random when you can't solve them. Maybe they're mine. And then he claims 37 offenses. What really happened, I think, to Zodiac was he was nearly captured after the killing of Paul Stein, the cab driver. And, uh, you know, he's lumbering along and and, um, probably covered in blood. But the police don't talk to him because there was an incorrect report that the suspect was black. So they don't stop Mm -hmm. Zodiac, and he slips away only by chance. And then he never kills again. And I think that it's because he was nearly captured, got spooked, and then realized he could amuse himself by taking credit for crimes that weren't his. That reveals that very much the motive was that feeling of slithering like a snake under people that could strike at any time, you know, and, and get ego fulfillment. But he, I think, especially loved needling it to women and figures of authority. Makes you wonder what happened when he was growing up uh that would you know sounds like mom and dad to me do you think that individuals like zodiac and jack the ripper do you think that even though on scene there was no sign of sexual gratification that it's something they fantasized and relived when they went home and still that it was a and maybe even the idaho four killer uh that it would be a sense of sexual gratification maybe ejaculation, uh, in just thinking about what they had done. I think that from experience and all I've read, and it is considerable, 
there are very few serial killers that don't at least engage in an eroticized reliving or fantasy of offenses, even when there is not a very overt sexual component in the killing itself. For example, it is not surprising to discover unusual pornography or certain fetishes or writings with a sexual tone, etc., that are present in individuals who commit these offenses. For example, I am convinced that in the Idaho case, there probably was some stalking and keeping of lots of pictures of a of an attractive young woman or or feeling a godlike amusement at kind of being around when they didn't know it. And I think what you would have had in that situation was something like wanting to come across like a heroic, helpful figure when, in fact, you were, for example, in, on Dateline, there was an incident described of a woman who had her home broken into and her mm-hmm. stuff was messed with. So then she reaches out to Koberger for help. And the speculation is perhaps when he came in and gained access to her passwords and stuff to install what was supposed to be cameras and stuff to help her, that he might have been looking at her, right? That's total speculation, but that's very interesting. The Zodiac incidentally used tricks like that. If he committed the Cherry Joe Bates murder, what happened there was she comes out of the library and uh, she can't start her car. What she doesn't know is that he's messed with it. So then he's waiting there to heroically say, oh, I'll take you to my car. And then along the way, kills her. Or if he is guilty in the Kathleen Johns case, where he picks a woman up with her baby, what happened there was he messed with the, with the bolts on a, a woman's wheel. First, he's driving along. He recalls out the window and goes, something's wrong with your wheel. She goes, really? He says, I'll look at it. Then he loosens the bolts on the wheel. Now she tries to drive away. Wheel comes off. He says, see, I told you so. You're going to have to get in my car. Then as he's driving along with Kathleen Johns, who recognized him to be Zodiac from Wanted Poster, he says, I think it's about time. And she says, about time for what? And he says, about time to die. And he says, I'm going to throw you, you know, your baby out the window and I'm going to kill you. So she, of course, bolts out of the moving vehicle with the child and, and hides the baby in a field until she's discovered later. That thing of posing as a helper, but really being somebody who is going to hurt people is very interesting. Now, isn't that revealing psychologically that you must have been someone once upon a time who was foolish enough to believe that somebody was kind and cared about you, but you got tricked. So to level the playing field, you have to do that to someone, right? So, th- so that suggests somebody who, who once was foolish enough to believe that people were kind and were going to love him, but he got fooled. That happens sometimes in a person who grows up in a house where they're told that they're terrific, and then they go out in the world and find out they're weird, and they're mad that their parents told them they were terrific. Or they, they fall in love with a person who's mocking them behind their back. In other words, somebody must have done. You see that, for example, in Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy would say to a person, oh, will you help me? You know, I, got, I have a cast. I got a right. sailboat on my roof, whatever. And if the person is, quote unquote, dumb enough to be kind, they're punished for it. Now, you're the fool who believed somebody you know, that, that, that thought being kind was okay, right? And why would he do that? Well, because... He had trusted in his family. He had trusted that the woman that he thought was his sister, he, you know, he found out she was actually his biological mother and was being lied to. Mm-hmm. The woman that he was infatuated with that was dating him, that gave him a sense of status and, and made him feel good about himself, dumps him. Now the idea is to project onto the victim. You're the idiot who trusts people. You're the fool who thinks being kind is smart. So I think you get a clue in the Idaho murders. You get a clue, if we're right about this posing as a helper, that this is a person who was disappointed by somebody who he thought loved him and didn't, or or thought that the world was going to like him, and he couldn't understand why they didn't. And I think if Koberger is the guy, that my speculation would be that he had a very mechanical kind of way of approaching people like they were a science or something. And he couldn't understand why he couldn't get people to like him. He didn't understand that he was odd. He couldn't reduce them to a predictable thing. That's exactly the kind of person who would stalk. Because then you know everything about a person. You know everything to say to win them over. You know everything, you know, every intimate thing about them. So that you can fake being good at social skills. You cheated because you watched them when nobody was looking, right? And, it, and so that it gives you a sense of control over the relationship, power over the relationship, predictability in the relationship. 
And what better way to, to render the object completely permanent than to kill them? Then you always know where they are. They're part of you forever. So, Dr. Bricado, I cannot keep you all afternoon, but I've got to ask you about one more case, because this case, which is the Rex Hureman case, oh. what bothers me <laughs> about the Rex Hureman case, well, there's a lot, but I just can't believe that he only killed these four women and that he did nothing leading up to it, you know, in his 20s and, and earlier on. And then after these huge hiatuses, I understand that depending on what was going on in his life, that can cause a break in behavior. But I want to hear what you think as to whether there are more victims out there. Well, there are four, well, really five different types of serial killers. And the most common is serial sexual homicide. In serial sexual homicide, where you repetitively kill usually women, but you kill a person who is an object of sexual desire as an expression of domination, control, manipulation over and over again to play out fantasy. The average age of committing your first murder is about 27. The notion that you would have somebody who didn't start until, you know, decades later is already ridiculous. It would make him, if he's guilty, it would make him like unique in the annals of crime. You know, it just doesn't make sense. What probably happened is that from childhood and adolescence, he was already upset about some factor that left him feeling he had to level the playing field and living in a world of fantasy that was going to be played out through misogynistic hostility. Probably there were sexual offenses uh, of some perverse nature, stalking, obscene pornography, you know, etc., stealing underwear, something it usually starts like that. And then it eventually spills over into sexual assaults where there may or may not be murder and then eventually murder. And then once it's it, it happens, there's a, a repetitive playing out until you perfectly hone the fantasy. And then it becomes kind of almost habitual, like, you know, and you do it better and better and you, you, you get rid of more traces and et cetera. Now, I have looked in my own data at hundreds of these cases and I figured out that the average number of victims for a sexually sadistic serial killer is about 12. The, the probability that you're looking at four is questionable to me. There are very few cases you can count them on just a couple of hands, BTK being one of them, where you have these long breaks between murders, right? Very, very unusual. And they, that seems to be related to stresses in the person's life and if the people around them are supporting them or they're feeling out of control. But even in those cases, people speculate that there aren't really long breaks. It would be highly improbable if he is guilty of killing the four, that there were not others. The other thing you want to bear in mind is that these people tend to have several collections of bodies, right? So that there is going to be a stock a pile of them in one place, the stockpile in another place, and they'll be very secretive about where the other locations are. But usually there are little collections of them. And you should not see a major change in MO between them. You could, but it would be like, for example... You wouldn't look at the Gilgo cases and then find a stockpile of victims somewhere else that have been like massively dismembered and think that they were probably committed by the same person unless there was a major change in MO over time. It's possible, but chances are you would see a lot of similarity because everything is done as part of a fantasy. And I think the binding, you know, of the of the body and all that mm. are so much a part of the fantasy that I don't see why you'd want to take someone's arms and legs off. You, you need the binding for the, for the erotic excitement of the victim, of the, of, the, of the perpetrator, excuse me. I think that you, you want to be careful to not leap to the conclusion that whenever a body turns up, you know, in Long Island, to think that it has to be a Gilgo beach killer case, there could be, for example, another serial killer. There could be victims of Joel Rifkin or some other person who was active mm -hmm. in the area. And Joel Rifkin was somebody where you would be less surprised to find a mutilated body than, right. than somebody. So I'm very suspicious that there's a mixture going on of bodies, and but I think that there likely are going to be more. As far as motive is concerned, I mean, as always, uh, you know, this is somebody who clearly felt rejected, socially rejected, probably by women, huge guy, insecure, made fun of, angry, control freak loved sadistically, you know, tormenting women psychologically. My favorite story about Hoyerman, because I think it so speaks to who he is, is the story that there was a female employee at his company 
his architectural firm who wanted time off. He didn't want to give it to her. And she said, well, you won't be able to find me. I'm, I'm going to be at sea. When she's on the boat, she gets a piece of paper under the door that says something to the effect of, I told you I'd find you anywhere. Now, that is a classic story of the type of person we're dealing with here, right? I think it's more a matter of when we discover that there are additional people probably victimized, but we don't know. It would make him, let's put it this way, more like other people in the, of the same ilk if he is guilty. Is it possible he's some exception that had this isolated group of victims? I suppose so, but then people like me would be studying him a long time because he'd be pretty unusual. <laughs> All right, one last question in regard to this. So would somebody like a Bundy, who was married, German, who was married, and Raider, who was married, and many others, were they sadistic sexually with their partners? Well, this is a very interesting question. The answer is it depends on how good they were at fragmenting themselves. Now, there are two reasons why a, a serial killer might fragment the self. One is it's unconscious, like the psychologist Al Carlisle used to talk about. The person is trying to compensate for insecurities by having this chameleon-like, excellent, you know, social face that's sort of, you know, split, fragmented, and in the shadows, they're a killer, and they can't unite the two. People like that almost have a longing to bridge the split. They want to be people to see what they are in the shadows. For example, when Ridgway brought his wife out to a field to make love and didn't tell her that on the other side of the reeds was the festering body of a victim... The symbolism of it was to take my private life and the dirty secret life and to get them as close together as possible. Maybe they'll be united so that you you, you get that kind of. But then the other kind is the kind that does like BTK talked about when he spoke to Catherine Ramslin, Dr. Ramslin, this cubing where you intentionally show a different part of the self as part of a manipulation. It's not an unconscious process. It's a, an intentional fragmentation of the self. So depending upon whether the person is integrated, they can spill some of the dark secret life into the private life with the spouse. And what you can see is like, for example, in Bundy, Bundy would have the partner play dead sometimes sexually. You know, she'd have to stay perfectly still and appear dead or there'd be some strangling. But in the case of, let's say, BTK, it was more about like the wife walking in and discovering him engaging in some autoerotic behavior or something like that. Or there were photos hidden that if anybody had thought to look, you know, in certain places, they might discover them, and suddenly the, the split would be bridged. The answer is, it depends on the offender, but if the wife or the partner is astute enough, chances are they're going to pick up on something, because you can't hide it completely. Gacy's wife used to find the gay pornography in the house indicating he wasn't too interested in her. He was interested in male victims, right? In the, the Horman case, it's particularly puzzling because when originally, you know, it was thought that there were just these two hairs that were hers and one that was his, people started speculating, oh, maybe she was involved in some way, whatever. Now you've got this additional hair that appears to be tied to the daughter that's been mm -hmm. in the news. And you start wondering... Maybe it was just that they were in the house. There was hair from everybody there, you know, and, you know, who knows? Maybe they were in the vehicle. There was hair from everybody there. And these are just what got randomly picked up. We don't know. And I think the jury is out on the degree to which she knew what was going on. It may have also been that she knew about some of the sexual activities that brought people to the house, but had no idea about the possibility of homicide. Right. That might have been an extra that was only necessary for his sexual fulfillment but it may have been that they were people who participated in kinky stuff and you know that we can't you know listen there are people who do that so i think the jury is out on that but she sounds a little different than some of these other people where the wife is totally shocked you know like mm -hmm. my husband is an angel who only loves me or whatever the one thing that i think is more likely for the partner to see is the anger and the control needs they're more likely to say, I remember that every once in a while he would flip out. In the BTK case, uh, there's a story told by his daughter in podcasts and things she's talked about. I think it's fascinating. There's a story told that they're sitting at a dinner table, and I think it was the brother spills a dish of pasta. Now, I had said to, to Kerry Rawson, is it possible that the sauce reminded him of blood? But the spill activates him. And then, by her description, 
he becomes almost demonic looking. His eyes change. He becomes completely vicious. And he starts strangling the son. So that in that moment, he was BTK. Just for a second, he was BTK. And then you go back to the composed, controlled self. So the answer is, it depends on how good the person is at compartmentalization. That's the key. If they're lousy at it, not only will the wife have seen it, but all the people around them are going to say, oh, yeah, every once in a while, he would flip out. He would say really sexually weird things. He would make a pass at me that was kind of strange. He couldn't help but ask questions about Gilgo <laughs> when we were out talking that suggested he was a little too interested in it. And he sounds more like that. I, I really can't thank you enough for being here, for all of your knowledge. Does it just feel like you just woo, laid it all out? That could have been a book right there. I think the public likes a, a podcast where they don't just hear the stuff they hear everywhere else. I think they want to get into the weeds about this stuff. And, and I think it's a way of saying, you know, we know how bright you are out there. So we want to we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty with you and you decide what's interesting and what isn't interesting. Nothing wrong with it with getting into the, the didactic with people. I think they like it. So, Hey, you know what? The people out in this audience, that's who makes up juries. And right. so I just find it interesting that, you know, people want to talk down. I say, put it out there. And, right. and I just love your knowledge and your brain. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Well, anytime. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in to Break the Case. And if you like what you saw, the one thing you can still do free in this country, and there's not much, is you can subscribe. We'd really love to have you as a subscriber to the channel. Until then, may justice be served.